group in central Vermont, and our mission is to improve the health of the way of the um, watershed, which was a big negative. Um, I'm also on the WOV steering committee, um, co-presenting with Neil, who's the manager of the Mapping Assessment and Planning Program, which is part of DEC's Watershed Management Division. Close enough. Yes. Um, <laughs> so um, I thought I'd start with a quick overview of what exactly it is we're going to talk about today, turn it over to Neil for a presentation about some state resources that could be helpful to all of us uh, in this part of this discussion, and then we'll spend the last 30 minutes or so sort of talking about some specific solutions to the LMT identified um, last year so we could continue the conversation. Um, but essentially, how many folks here were at the May meeting last year? So roughly a third. Okay, so <clears throat> by way of background, at the last meeting like this last year, um, we had a sort of a brainstorming session about six different topics that watershed groups and partners are dealing with, from education to restoration to monitoring. And folks rotated through the six tables and provided information on what are the successes in that particular area. Thank you. Um, what are the challenges and what are the opportunities? Um, and so today we'll be looking at that set of information that we all sort of, uh, or a third of us plus others, contributed to the conversation about water quality monitoring specifically. Um, Neil, uh, like I said, going to talk about what the state can offer um, that uh, directly addresses some of those challenges. And then we'll go through an exercise of making sure that list is still current. Um, and then sort of thinking about what we can do to address some of those challenges. Um, both individually and as a group uh, with the state, with the web. Um, and I'm hoping if we have enough time, we can, we can create sort of a roadmap for some of those challenges so we can go out of here with plan to do something um, specific on the ground. So, um, I have, I will pass it now, have a chance to just sort of look it through um, the notes from that meeting so you can sort of have some context for the conversation. Are there questions about process or goals or anything? Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to Neil. Great. So thank you. Um, you teed it up well. And really, my role here is just to sort of report a little bit about um, sort of some of the things the state is doing with uh, citizen based data, particularly data that are collected under the La Rosa Par Partnership Program and other data sources. I want to present to you um, a new online data tool that is very much in beta form, um, but is actually in a stealth mode available online right now. We're going to uh, we're going to test it out and hope it works right here with my computer, and then just uh, provide a couple of remarks that I think can tee up a, a larger conversation. I'm actually pleased that uh, some of the UVM folks are in the audience today because. I have holes in my monitoring map. I manage the monitoring assessment planning program, so I know where monitoring happens. And I have holes on that map, and I happen to know that the holes are filled by denizens of students coming out of various high schools that are out there collecting data, and I'm hopeful that we can um, put those things together. So I'm going to provoke some discussion, and I may be a little bit provocative. And one of the things that I want to do today is to address a narrative that I believe is beginning to take root that the state doesn't really adequately use the data that are collected by the La Rosa Partnership Program. Um, I don't think that's the case, but I do want to present some uses that the data has put to the partnership data and solicit feedback for how we might better rely on that resource. Uh, as I said, describe the new data portal, get some feedback on how to improve your ability to use the data and information that you collect the monitoring information that you get, how better to use it, how we can help you use it better to promote your own aims and goals. And then, as I said, um, carry forth Mary's uh, discussion afterwards. A quick, because I realize that not everybody in the room may actually know what I mean when I say the La Rosa Partnership uh, Program. La Rosa Partnership Program is a program that we started in the state back in 2003, and that is intended to support the capacity of watershed associations and other groups to conduct water quality monitoring in waters that are of joint interest to the state and to the groups. And so we basically have somewhat of a quasi-grant application process, and we provide uh, quasi-grant awards in the form of capacity in our laboratory to analyze tests uh, that would comprise a monitoring program. So since I didn't have that specifically said, thought I would. 
This data graph, which is one of the few data graphs I'm going to show you, basically articulates the proportion of samples that are uh, in of all water quality testing locations in our archive. And this is thousands and thousands and thousands. This shows you the proportion that are attributable to the Rosa Partnership Program to the Lakes Lay Monitoring Program. So everything in blue and green is citizen science, everything on the left. And everything that is DEC-led sampling is on the right. And so the basic take-home message is things kind of ebb back and forth with the years since the inception of the program in 2003 and up to 2013. Uh, but about 50 or even a little bit north of 50 percent of the entire capacity of the state to collect water quality data that goes into the state's water quality data archive are collected by citizen scientists. So this is, um, this is a big investment on our part and it's important information. And so it begs the question of how does the department use these types of data. And so we're going to take a little tour of Vermont. It's mostly words, but there's a few pictures to back it up, and I may tell a story or two. So um, in northwestern Vermont, a lot of folks have heard about Lake Carmi. Lake Carmi is a lake that's polluted by phosphorus. Sir, you live up there. I believe you were at a meeting that we had in December or um, November that I was part of. So Lake Carmi is subject to a TMDL, a Total Maximum Daily Load Pollution Control Plan for phosphorus. The upper right-hand photograph that you see is sort of uh, ice fluorescences and floating around on the lake at breakup. Is it looking like that yet? Not yet. Not even close. <laughs> so we've used data up there both in the development of the TMDL, in the promulgation, the substantiation of that pollution control plan, in the development of the implementation plan and currently in identifying hot spots um, for agricultural or other interventions. And we have a contract with a gentleman whom I respect a great deal right now who's combing through the Lake Carmi La Rosa program uh, collected data to get some very, very uh, fine conclusions that can be used by Agency of Agriculture in pursuing phosphorus reductions up there. Uh, the Huntington River is a uh, river in Chittenden County that was listed as impaired uh, due to E. coli bacteria. All of the data collected to substantiate that listing and the ultimate TMDL that was written for that river was from the Huntington River Conservation Partnership. South Chittenden River Watch, screw, uh, they have, they, they collect a lot of data on smaller streams in the, um, in the sort of central uh, Champlain Valley. I would say the most important finding from the screw data is the fact that these little streams that occur close to the edge of Lake Champlain don't really behave like the Lewis Creek or don't really behave like the La Platte River. Acre for acre, there's more phosphorus that comes out of those. And our models, our TMDL models for Lake Champlain didn't really account for that. The new model does, and the new model specifically used these data. EPA were given these data. These were used in tuning the large pollution control model that is going into making the new Lake Champlain TMDL now. Um, and it caused, the, the data were used to promote any number of um, remediation projects as well. This was an older one, but up in the St. Albans area, the St. Albans Watershed Association documented some illicit residential sanitary discharges which were addressed in the, in the system. That was a few years ago, right, Karen? But I got that one from you. Um, and just some photographs. So this is a, this is the covered bridge over Holmes Creek, right, Bob? Um, which is one of the small slow winders in Lower Chittenden County. Huntington River here showing the use. Denise in the room? No. St. Albans Bay. Um, in West Central Vermont, so Addison County River Watch Collaborative is probably our oldest monitoring network in the state. They were cooking along for a good 10 years before we came along and offered a grant. Uh, to do lab services to which they said sign us up. That sounds great. They have a very mature system. Uh, their, their monitoring program rotates its way through the watersheds of their interest. They have air, um, sites that you might call sentinel sites they monitor every year. And then they have rotating sites that are in the interest of them. They're, those interests are mutually developed between the River Watch and our basin planner in that area. Uh, we put some pretty concrete projects on the ground as a result of La Rosa data. The Pond Brook subwatershed of Lewis Creek had a really neat intervention using uh, soft restoration techniques for eroding gullies that come off of farm fields. 
It's a project that the data took us to. The data identified the location. We found the gullies. It wasn't we. It was Lewis Creek Association and their contractors uh, identified an opportunity to fix those. And actually, we're translating the approach that we use to address those gullies to some other gullies in the Mallets Creek watershed or Mallets Bay watershed right now. Up in the Middlebury River, we've got data that suggests that the Middlebury River in the upper reaches uh, attains class A1 water quality criteria, so the highest level of classification of the water quality standards. Our basin plan for that area indicates that we will promote and pursue reclassification of waters in that area. Um, Little Otter Creek, we've identified and bracketed sources of E. coli or, or E. coli and bacteria contamination in that brook. Very similar things in the uh, South Lake Champlain tactical basin plan that was issued in 2014, identification of Flower and Wells Brook as target intervention areas, very specifically based on the data because if you take a drive through those watersheds, you know, and you open your eyes and you look around, they look pretty good. Yet we see some nutrient issues, we see some sediment issues, and we see some bacteria issues. So the data are bringing us to the, um, to the table there. Uh, Upper Otter Creek Watershed Council data were certainly used to develop the Otter Creek Basin Plan, but more importantly, I want to focus on Moon Brook here. Moon Brook is a, a stormwater impaired brook that drains through the center of Rutland. Um, the city of Rutland contested our determination of the stormwater impairment status of that brook. It's actually a contested case that was just adjudicated by a third party reviewer. We won, I think, really big. Um, the data that were collected by Upper Otter Creek Watershed Council were, you know, critical to the identification of the pollutants in that stream and were used in that third party review. So, you know, pretty important uses of citizen science data when the state agency is brought to suit as a result of a determination of impairment and we can bring that data forth and say, you know, here are some of the evidence. Not all the evidence, but important evidence. Up in northeast Vermont, um, we've used our data from the um, on Pompanusik River extensively in the development of the bacteria TMDL up there and in targeting specific pollution sources. I know, Mary, you work with Jim Ryan on a very regular basis to examine the data from the prior year and identify what specifically to do with it in the White River. Uh, I know that you have agricultural interventionists that are going out and looking at situations as a result of that data. The lower right-hand photograph um, is exemplary of the kind of thing that you might not see from the road, but that you might find with data from streams. And so up in the Memphremagog watershed, we've got really a neat machine running between the Memphremagog Watershed Association and our basin planner, where the data cause us to begin to look at certain small streams and what's going on there. And so this um, photograph right here of this large manure pile sitting at the banks of the brook is one that we were able to obtain a fairly hefty fine for for this agricultural operator. And not one, but several. So our data, in this case, the you know, La Rosa partnership data are being used to substantiate enforcement cases in fairly large levies. We are north of $100,000 in this particular operator over the last uh, few years, not even few years. And in southeastern Vermont, Southeast Vermont Watershed Association is in the room, or they were somewhere. Uh, bacteria impairment on the West River. The only data we have from the West River documenting the pollution status down there in terms of bacteria. But these data were granular enough. We were able, Marie Caduto, our planner down there, was able to actually identify very specific locations, bracketed monitoring that CIVWA conducted. We were able to go in there and address a couple of clear, obvious sources as a result. Um, similar efforts in Whetstone Brook, not quite as granular in terms of the outcomes yet, but they are looking, we are looking. And then uh, this, this bottom point is actually an important one that I think Kim over there might find interesting, and that is that the monitoring data that were collected by CIVWA have been used as we examine wastewater permit reauthorizations for a couple of facilities down in that area of Vermont. And so by using these data, we were able to document where we actually could attain more restrictive permit limits um, in order to reduce pollution to the river, or at least reduce effluent discharge to the river. Which is a good thing when we can use citizen data that's documented strong and we can say, you know, we see these effects and in the middle of a permit reauthorization we can change the permit limits to be more stringent as a result. So those are good outcomes. 
So some of the other uses to which we put our, you know, these data that we collect. Obviously, uh, we are responsible every two years to publish the annual integrated assessment report of water quality conditions statewide. And so we use La Rosa data extensively, NLA monitoring program data extensively, for determination of the condition of waters and of the trends on those waters. We've got new numeric nutrient criteria on the books that were just promulgated in the last year. They were adopted in October. Uh, these data are very nicely suited to be able to look at the attainment of those criteria or not. Um, I'm going to highlight the reasonable potential analyses because I think that represents an opportunity that I want to talk about and we will later on. A reasonable potential analysis is, is, is this. When you write a wastewater permit that says you can't discharge more than, say, 10 pounds of phosphorus, 5 pounds of nitrogen, whatever it says at a certain flow, it's helpful if you actually have data from the stream in order to see whether that effluent is going to be protective of the stream. And so one of the things that our monitoring program has done over time, and with the La Rosa program also, is we've set up upstream downstream monitoring around wastewater treatment facilities. So as we go through every five years and that permit is reauthorized, we can examine whether that permit and its effluent limits are sufficiently protective to protect the river, not only mathematically, because you do math to you know, calculate concentrations, but actually empirically, do we see good conditions in the river as a result? I think there's a real opportunity here to consider partnerships between municipalities and watershed associations where the watershed associations may be able to serve the municipalities by conducting these monitoring activities to which they're becoming required under their permits. So I throw that out there. I wish there was a larger group to hear that idea because I think it's a good idea and I think the municipalities may think so too, as long as it's approached in partnership. Uh, we've used the data for comments associated with Act 250 or Section 248 projects, so big energy projects or big development projects. And so a couple of questions is, you know, what other uses should we be putting these data to, which aren't really addressed um, on our slides here? We certainly give them up to academic researchers and high school kids and anybody who wants to know about, you know, data. So a couple of questions for discussion. And I think what I'm going to do is, is, is hammer through my presentation here and then we'll come back to revisit these. But are these good uses and is it enough? Are there other uses that state hasn't thought about which within our capacity we can do? Are there other ways we can use these data either to support watershed management or support your use of the data? So what are things that the state can do to facilitate your ability to use the data to improve conditions in your watersheds? Um, I think I know the answer to this question. Do you, does your particular group receive enough support from us, enough guidance from us? If not, what kind of guidance could we provide? And another one, just to scratch your head and think about, when you ask for guidance and we provide it, do you agree or do you not? So, things to talk about. When WOV, WOV, Watersheds United was coming together, I remember a particular meeting in Woodstock, and I think I was speaking at that meeting a little bit, just around a big table like this, and mentioned that, you know, my new data guy or my new data gal were working on this new data portal. I always think these things just happen by magic, you know, and they're easy. They're not that easy, and it takes time to build infrastructure, but we are really close. I mean, we're so close that our data are actually streaming online now, but we're just not absolutely sure that it's working right yet. But I'm going to show you a little bit right now. So the goals of a, a data display system are that we can show you all of everything that we've got in our archive. Chemistry, biology, habitat, lakes, wetlands, streams, all of it. And present it in a way that you can type, uh, I don't know, Bob, you can type Holmes Creek, or you can type Lamoille River, or you can type Third Branch or Tweed, whatever you want, and you'll get a roster of sites. Um, we also want to allow access by map, so you can surf the, the atlas or something like it, find a water quality site, tap it, bring up information. And what I really want to do, which is in gray, and I'm not sure if you can read it, and this is hard, it's a lot harder than you think, is actually to document not the condition of sites, but the condition of collections of sites within small sub-watersheds, so that we could paint small sub-watersheds, you know, yellow or green or red or orange or puce or whatever. That's hard 
because you've got to decide what you're going to use for indicators. But it's a really, you know, we are building the architecture to be able to do it. So let me show you. When I sit at my desk now inside the firewall, I can, I, I see this stuff now and I pull it up every single day. Um, so what you see here is the watershed data portal, WDP, and up high there where it says where, I just typed moon, moon. And on Moonbrook, I got these sites. There's actually a whole bunch more. Moon 553 blah, 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 09. That means that's River Mile 0.9 upstream from the Otter Creek. I just happen to know that. But so I also happen to know this is a stormwater impaired reach. Notice how it's all red? It's all red here. So this is for fish. Up in the top, you see there's a little checkbox for fish, and you can see the results of that, and you can see individual fish assessments for each individual year. So what I'm going to show you is actually the, um, the fish assessment for Moonbrook for that point nine site, okay? And so what you're seeing up here, some information about the site up high, the years of data, 91, a long time ago, 02, 04, 08, 10, 13, and 14, we've done a lot of work recently. These are biometrics. These are descriptors of the community of fish based on the animals that we, were, that we collected in, during the electrofishing pass. And these are the actual taxa and their, their, their composition. So there's all these data about you know, how many different fish were there per mile or per reach and so forth. But I've highlighted this stuff. This is when I get into this, this is what as a manager I, I get to look at. I used to look at all this. Now I just look at this. Fair, poor, poor, fair, fair, poor, poor does not meet water quality standards. To meet water quality standards, you got to be either good, fair, or better. You got to be typically good. So that's um, based on non-game fish. I'm just going to show you another example here of West Branch Little River. So West Branch Little River comes off a of stow, comes off a of smuggler's notch, nice place, a bunch of site, a little bunch of locations here. So I just kind of draw your attention to River Mile 6.5, located above the confluence of Pinnacle Brook and above Bingham Falls. So this is where we're going to go away from um, the presentation, and we're going to attempt to go online. So uh, I just grabbed three sites. One was at Little River, uh, Mile 6.5, and then a site near Sugarbush, the Rice Brook, one you'll know about, Kim. And then a site up in the Winooski River. The thing I want to show you here is you can see these long numbers basically mean this is a, a state site, the state samples here. Over here, you've got a scenario where the state is sampling here. This is River Mile 83.8 on the Winooski up near Cabot. But La Rosa volunteers sample here too. So we're able to integrate our data together in one sort of data display. So, this is West Branch, Little River, River Mile 6.5, downstream of Sugarbush, I'm oh, sorry, downstream of Stone Mountain Resort. You've got a grade of biologic condition based on aquatic macroinvertebrates. These are DEC data going from excellent down to poor. Good is the line. Okay, that's where we draw the line between not meeting standards and meeting standards. General sense, things are kind of getting better here. Management is occurring, it's good. For the last three years, we've seen data results that are either in the very good to good range, and that seems to be perpetuating. That's good news. Here's some water quality data. These are just kind of sparkline graphs. This is all, this is online. This is live, this is real. So we are online, I'm on a web page. This is going right in through the firewall, grabbing data out of our data archive and presenting it in real time to you guys now. You know, not everything that you might want to know about these um, parameters are here, but here's your turbidity, your total phosphorus, nitrogen, chlorides, pH, conductivity. I'm going to make it so you can check other parameters or uncheck them as you wish. But, you know, if you look at these numbers, you've got chlorides, uh, average chloride 9.4, minimum 2.5, that's pretty low. Phosphorus is looking real good here. Turbidity is looking real good here. And then habitat. So here you can see the habitat composition ranging from clays down through sands, gravels, coarse gravels, and then back to like ledge, big ledge. So you don't want a lot of this for most streams. You'll want stuff in this area. And actually, this is a really nice distribution of particle size for a particular stream. Can I ask a quick question? How many um, overlapping sites do you have at FDEC and La um, Rosa data? Like, I do not know. I mean, like thousands? Well, no, but more like hundreds. 
I do not know. Um, there's a lot that are real close but aren't right on top of each other. And then there are some networks that were designed specifically to overlap. So, so I'm not going um, to keep going to show you these other ones. Like, uh, you know, I wanted to get into the Winooski, Sean, you know, to show you a Winooski site that had some La Rosa data because there's a lot of, of chemistry data in there. But that was just too time wasteful. Um, so instead, I want to show you a couple maps. So this is the area, um, Winooski River Valley up here, Shelburne Bay, Lake Champlain, Shelburne Pond, Lake Iroquois. So if you can squint well enough, you can see there are little beakers that are blue. That means that's water chemistry available at that site. These are, these are sampling locations of Vermont. If you see a fish, and this fish is red, that means the most recent sampling event, not all sampling events, but the most recent sampling events came out somewhere around poor, because red means poor in this, in this um, framework. Here you've got a yellow bug. Remember, yellow means good in this color scheme, so that's OK. But in essence, if I step back from this, and I do this all the time on my computer, where do I have data and where do I not? You know, I'm beginning to see Huntington River, a lot of La Rosa data here, which is the vast majority of it. Got the La Platte River, Caves Brook. There's a lot of La Rosa uh, La Platte Watershed Partnership data there. There's also a good amount of our data. A lot of lake monitoring data are available as well from DEC and the Lake Monitoring Program. You see a lot of red up there. Those are your stormwater impaired streams. And then over to Lake Memphremagog. So this is the southern part of Lake Memphremagog reaching up to the border. And I just have a couple of uh, areas sort of highlighted on the map here. Our blue beakers, they don't have color coding yet. If they did, they'd be all red, and so would those. Because these represent areas where we actually use the data to hone in on agricultural enforcement. And we've gotten actually super good results. In particular, this site up here, which is on the uh, Johns River up in Derby, we had really, really good outcomes there. It's the, Maybe. It depends because, you know, there's so much involved in trying to decide, you know, does, it, does one sample exceed standards? You know, we have to kind of filter it through the uh, assessment methodology. That's that watershed condition thing. So, boy, it's pouring. So questions for discussion on this, on this aspect would be, you know, any reactions to this? Wow, gee whiz, or oh, like everybody does that. Um, and actually... The Addison County River Watch Collaborative has a really nice online database that's served up through the Addison County Regional Planning Commission. It's not quite as prettied up as what this will end up being, but it's, it's all there content-wise. I'm interested in getting some uh, feedback on this, and I'd like to invite a group of people to maybe work with us on developing it and on giving us feedback as to what you see. What you saw is what's out there. It's very raw right now. And also, you know, we need to provide interpretive information. Like, I can't stand around in front of a computer screen and do this every time somebody might want to pull up some data and find out what it says. So that's the next steps there. Uh, I'm just going to close up quickly with uh, some updates from the La Rosa program. So Jim Kellogg, I asked Jim if there's anything you wanted me to pass on. So one of the things we're doing in addition to developing this data access is we want to put together a web page and web presence for La Rosa Partnership participants, so we would actually like some feedback on what might go in there. Largely, what, do we, what should we put in there that allows you to make hay with your data? Uh, in some instances, just simply being kind of contributing to the state's archive is something that people can make hay with. Sometimes people need more, so we'd like to know what that is. Our desire for, you know, putting together partnerships on La Rosa partnerships is, is the same as it's always been. We want the, the sites to be of mutual interest. And mutual interest may mean that we have no particular worry in it, but you guys, for a particular reason, may need to sample there. And so we want to enable you to find out the results of that information because that's important to your group. More common is an area where maybe we mutually share a concern or we mutually share an interest in learning more about an unmonitored location or an unmonitored stream. Uh, in terms of regulatory compliance monitoring, this is that upstream, downstream stuff. I think there's a real opportunity here, but I also think that it's important to do that kind of work in partnership with municipalities and in partnership with permittees. 
So we're always happy to bridge a conversation where, you know, a group may be able to have the conversation with the municipal wastewater operator or have the conversation with the MS4, for example, around can we help do some of this work. MS4s are required, by the way, to have a, a, a public outreach component. Some of them accomplish this by doing monitoring. Uh, Megan Moyer does this. And we want to build capacity, but we don't want to make it too complex. It's already complex enough that you have to figure out where you want to sample and talk to Jim, and we're slow to respond, and I know all that stuff. Um, and you have to do the quality assurance plan, and that's kind of arduous. But then at the same time, you know, there are sometimes opportunities for additional parameters and new things. And so, you know, what does work, what can work for you guys, those are the kinds of conversations we want to carry forward. Outcome from last year's meeting is there was a need to develop flow guidance. I've actually, that is there. That's been developed. Blaine Hastings, our hydrologist, has written it. It's okay. It's still a little techie speak, but it's available. Um, I can actually, I sent it to Anne this morning with the request that Anne send it out after I get done talking. So if you don't mind, that would be great. Um, and then, so we'd love to get some feedback from you all on that. We are building the ability to catalog the information that you might put into your monitoring results as a result of using that guidance for flow. Uh, we've got some new projects cooking up in um, Franklin County, uh, one with Denise looking at end of tile drain phosphorus treatment systems, real excited about that. Another looking at a constructed wetland to treat milk house waste. Um, so those are really experimental designed projects but that we're doing through the La Rosa program. And one of the things Jim tells me is that groups are beginning to focus more on nutrients and chloride and de-emphasizing a little bit their work on E. coli bacteria, trying to focus that towards swimming sites. I'm a big supporter of that. Uh, I do know that sometimes having bacteria data, though, makes it a lot easier to go talk to a farmer. You know, you've got a lot of nitrogen. Huh? You've got a lot of bacteria. Huh? It, it has a different response. Or at least so I'm told. So... Just lastly, some discussion points. Um, the lay monitoring program, which I didn't speak to about a lot here, is our lakes side of the La Rosa partnership. It's slightly different in that our volunteers and our citizen scientists there conduct the collection, but they're supported in all ways in terms of quality assurance, in terms of sampling guidance, um, in terms of analyzing the data at the back end. It's more of a state program where the collection is conducted by volunteers as opposed to the state assisting groups in carrying forth their own monitoring programs, which is what the La Rosa Partnership does. There's a lot of opportunity for us to help, but our capacity is limited, and this is the busiest I've ever seen in our office this year with the new bill coming forward and a lot of work that's going to be coming as a result of that. There's a need for infield sample training, I think, and for consistency and procedures, and I'd love to talk about how, the, how to make that work better. You know, we do have the Vermont Surface Water Monitoring Guide, but that's a book that you got to read. Um, I'd like to have the conversation with some groups about, you know, when we get approached about we want to do orthophosphorus or we want to do metals or we want to do, you know, semi-volatile organic carbons in water, have the conversation about what is it specifically you're trying to learn there and do we need to add that complexity. Lastly, I just want to point out that there may be funding opportunities in the new water bill that heretofore have not existed to support monitoring work, and that's kind of exciting. So we'll see how it comes, right? And I think through the beginning slides that I presented, it was clear how reliant our tactical basin planning process is on these types of monitoring partnerships. And so we want to do nothing but expand that ability. So just some pretty pictures of different people that you may know to you know, round out our discussion. I'll turn it back over to Mary, unless there's specific questions. Quick question, the previous slide, your second bullet, it's had something to do with the new load lab location. I oh, right yes, I did, didn't I? Does anybody want to know about that? <laughs> <laughs> I've just heard from some yeah. people that it's really hard to get stuff to Burlington. So. Well, it is. It's hard, it's hard to get stuff to Burlington, except, except if you're in southwestern Vermont, it's actually easier than it was to get it to Waterbury. It's never perfect. Um, the new laboratory is to be built at the Vermont Technical College campus in Randolph. A tremendous boon for the White River Partnership. Kind of helpful down in southern Vermont, uh, southeastern Vermont in particular. It's a quicker ride. Um, a little bit distant from the state offices in Montpelier. So be it. I know it's difficult. Um, 
one of the things we've done previously is tried to assist in setting up sort of sample transfer chains where I know Southeast Vermont Watershed Association used to run their stuff up to White and White would run it up and the basin planner would pick it up and it'd get delivered to the laboratory. That stuff kind of happens organically. There's a training in early May, I don't know the date, somebody in the room probably already does, with Jim Kellogg up at the University of Vermont lab. When you're there, you're gonna get to meet our new laboratory director whose name is uh, Dr. Guy Roberts. Lives in Huntington, has a background in developing digesters, like methane digesters, manure, and uh, food waste digesters. Really cool, very interesting guy. Guy, very interesting gentleman, guy. So, um, the, in terms of the timeline for the new laboratory, we're probably looking at 2018 to move into there, maybe 2017, but I'm not gonna hold my breath. The legislature is gonna decide very soon as to what's going to be in the capital bill and what's not. I think we're quite hopeful it'll be in there. I don't know, Kim, if you know anything about whether it's in there or not. I don't know. So, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to slip by that. That's important. Any specific questions for me or back to Mary? Um, yes. So, <coughs> okay, what's this um, training in June going to be at in Burlington? I'm just curious if it's something. Yep. And then, um, we talked about, you know, there's these patches that um, you don't have data for, whether it's DEC or La Rosa Partners data. And, you know, we do a lot of, um, you know, Lindsay does as well, collection, water quality testing, biological yep. assessment, physical assessments. We basically do a geomorphic assessment. Um, you know, phase one of the streams that the students go out to, and I think they do a pretty good job at it. Actually, mm -hmm. have an interactive map and database that they upload their data to, how can we, you know, get that data to you? I know a lot of um, teachers have been asking, well, what's the use of, like, doing this, you know, if, like, the state's not going to look at it, and maybe it's something I just need to contact you guys and say, how can we, you know, help you and you help us? I think we need to, we need to have a sort of structured conversation around it, and the, the structure of the conversation, with, and don't take anything from my remarks because it's just how I often think as state guys. Yeah. Um, you know, we need to talk about collection procedures and whether they, and I, mean, I know they're good, yeah. but we still have to talk about it. We have to talk about analysis procedures and whether they're consistent with the analysis procedures that go into the water quality data archive. Because everything that flows through, all, everything you saw goes through that DEC laboratory, yeah. or the vast majority of it, and the rest of it gets screened through a set of lenses to make sure it's good. So we have to have that conversation, and then really a conversation about, you know, what data should go in, and if it should, well, how do we push it in? Um, if there's one thing that our data manager is good at, I mean, he, building tools like this is sort of voodoo, and it's, you know, wow, kind of cool, it's amazing, it's <coughs> all .NET and programming. But he can push data, I mean, big chunks of it very fast. Um, all you basically do is build a bridge between the two databases, and you just push it from one side to the other. It sounds easy. Yeah. But we should have that conversation because, you know, you have a lot of data up in the Lamoil that are valuable and I don't doubt that the vast majority of them are really 100% totally solid. There's another piece. Some of the data, I don't know, maybe not in your archive, but some of the data collected by EPSCOR um, are data that the professors don't necessarily want to give up yet. And that's real. Um, any data that goes into our data archive are, of course, discoverable and publicly available 100% because it's public resource, you know, the public investment funded. So that's another piece of the conversation. But we should have that conversation. Okay. And I can, I can build the bridge, and I won't necessarily be the guy to be there, except the end, maybe the first meeting. But so. OK, if I, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Kim first. Uh, I was just going to say, how can we I'll leave a whole list of questions there, so how can we provide you with that? Those those questions? Well, we'll talk about some of them right now. Um, yeah. You know, and then hopefully we'll have a big aha outcome and we can carry forward some sort of process to make it so afterwards. So uh, you have a number of sites where you have DEC and La Rosa data. How consistent are they? You mean between the two? Yeah. Well, considering that the collections that you do fill bottles that run through our laboratory, they're real good. It's not like we're going at the same time and doing the same thing to kind of check out the results. So you guys are using the same, essentially the same protocol. 
you're using our protocols. We're using your protocol. <laughs> right. right. Sorry. Um, so the way it works for us is, you know, we <coughs> do not have the capacity and the field presence that Addison County River Watch or South Chittenden has or, you know, MWA to a degree or other, other groups. You know, like you guys have big volunteer networks that feed and we can't be in all those places at all those times. The uh, Sample Palooza is a great example. You know, uh, Connecticut River effort, four states, one day. How many sites? Lots. Yeah, we couldn't do that. No, no way. So um, it's not like that the one is used to validate the other. It's that they go together and comprise a body of evidence. One of the questions I had on the evaluation piece is, is there a way instead of having public purposes this report, instead of having just good, bad, we have some points of like phosphorus being point so and so being okay. Mm -hmm. So that when they show when they show something that's 110 compared to 20, they get some idea of just how bad it is. Right. I thought I had a slide. You're, that's exactly what we need to do: is sort of identify some thresholds. I thought I had a slide here that showed literally a. A data table, like one of the other uh, attributes of our system is you can pull data for any site, and there's lots of them. You can pull data for multiple sites and tables. So that's the guidance that we need to put together, um, which is important. I wanted to show you one other thing, though. It's very relevant, and I'm going to have to attempt to do this again, but please bear with me because this is worth it. So you're just going to look at the mountain for a second. Because some of that is already there. Uh, and hopefully we will get... That's Dick's mountain in the Adirondacks, by the way. So I'm bringing up another one of those reports right now, and I want to show you the interpretation. Because we have it uh, for our internal data already and for the macroinvertebrates. So one of the things that I didn't do one of the things that I did not do when I was showing you the report out is to show you the actual underlying data. So when you saw that figure with good bugs, fair bugs, poor bugs, if you click on the more info button, and I forgot to do that, you can see the results. So this is Rice Brook near Sugarbush. And basically, there are eight specific biological metrics that comprise a biological assessment for this year. They all go together to comprise this poor, fair, good. You notice how things are starting with poor, and they end up down here with very good. And down at the bottom of the screen, and we can do the same for the chemistry, are the thresholds. All these numbers correspond to numbers to which you compare these numbers so that you would turn the screen. You know, this turns green if you're above 28. This is 37, so it's green. So basically, you know, this is an assessment based on the macroinvertebrates of this particular site on Rice Brook near Sugarbush, showing a tremendous improvement over time. But this is exactly the kind of thing that I think you're talking about. So. Anyway. What time is it? Oh, okay. So we have 20 more minutes, right? Or did I overgo? Um, why don't we just uh, do you mind going at the I'm going to. Okay. I just have to do the old three, two, one thing here. Um, I got to figure that out. I have to ask the tech so, guys. Thank you, Eli. I was taking notes as you went beside the challenges section of the page, realizing that a lot of what you talked about could sort of be a, a piece of the conversation about solutions. So um, I think everyone has. One of these, does anyone need a hand up? Um, and I initially wanted to go through each section, but given our time constraint, I thought we might just look at the challenges um, and sort of first uh, sort of go through them so we understand and maybe see if there are one or two that we can address either from what Neil was talking about or from other ideas that we have. Um, so several of them have to do with, with funding. The first is long term stable funding is lacking, um, not enough to identify projects for assessment.
folks have other ones they want to add to the list? Um, do they still like to write down those to address? Um, so, yes, I add one that has to do with public understanding. Because I think most of the data that are reported makes the general public their eyes glaze over. Uh, um, so I think that's a challenge. How to yeah. interpret the data for the general public so that they will support for interaction. I want to reinforce that because that's what I was trying to bring up. A okay. ago was it, the data is good, but when you're when you've got a public meeting, you're holding with the folks from your area, and they're there to learn what's going on, and you start talking about this is this and this. You got to have some baselines mm -hmm. that state this is where you should be, this is where we are, this is where this is improved. So you know, in easy terms that they can follow along. Or because there's usually some uh, emotions flowing at the same time. Right. And a lot of misunderstanding about what the data means. Or yeah. There's usually somebody who's, uh, not somebody, but there's usually a few folks who are, are upset. And if, if you don't keep it very clean, it doesn't take too long for it to get away. Great. follow that up real quickly, Mary, by saying that I think one of the things that's really important in addition to understanding you know, where the thresholds are is to understand that sometimes, you know, if you've got one number or two numbers, that that doesn't necessarily make a huge problem. You know, any number above a threshold is not necessarily good, but one number above a threshold is a lot better than, you know, every number a hundred times above the threshold. So, and that's in the interpretation and the guidance kind of area. Seems like we have at least three sort of categories of issues. One is the, you've got the data now, what, how do you communicate with it, how do you talk about it, how do you make it relevant for the people who have to use it. Um, one is certainly funding, that's an ongoing theme in these challenges identified last May. Um, and it's a more technical, and I don't feel like, Neil, you're
So Kim, did I capture what you said by sort of using the lake monitoring program as a model, an informational guide that could be applicable to lake scores, streams, and then La Rosa guidance training related to some of the information in that guide? Right. In terms of communicating or other things? Okay. So Kim, I'm just curious, what's in, what is in the uh, lake monitoring? I mean, what, what, what's missing in the La Rosa um, program that's in the lake monitoring? I think it's just the information. Information about it. Just the, so, you know, so it's almost similar to the Vermont F-score manual. It's just combining both of it. It's, it's more, it's geared for a lay person. So, I guess I'm for sure. So that's in terms of, yes, yeah, it's, it's like a screen, it's more like a screen manual. I think the other one is more like a lay person. So the, the volunteer guide to surface water monitoring is agnostic in terms of lakes or streams. It covers both. But the fundamental core between the Rosa partnership programs and the lay monitoring program is the lay monitoring program is, is a monitoring program where citizens collect samples. The state does the rest, all of it. Um, the state directs where and how there's interest from the lake association. We promote that very much. Absolutely. We train people to fill the bottles, fill the bottles. We collect the bottles. We bring the bottles to the lab. We analyze the bottles. We interpret the data. We publish the data in a report. So it's, it's a state monitoring program that relies on citizens to collect the samples. La Rosa is different. It's, um, the La Rosa program is really, we're enabling you by giving you the lab, the lab capacity which is the most expensive part of any monitoring program run by volunteers. We're giving you the lab capacity, but the, the, we're giving you that in exchange for you sampling sites that are in the state's interest, but it is entirely <coughs> Addison County River Watch's project, or White River Partnerships project, or Lewiski Upper Watershed Partnerships project. And so there's some, there's some different roles and different responsibilities. If we were to turn, it would be interesting, we've thought about the idea of turning the, the, you know, taking lay monitoring and grabbing streams with it too. Frankly, there would be some really good attributes of it. But I actually think that it may do a disservice in two ways. One is it would, the La Rosa, the contribution by the La Rosa Partnership Program for Watershed Association gives that Watershed Association something to take the funders to say, you know, we do this, we do this in partnership with the state, and we do it to achieve these aims as well. And we could use your help and support. If you are, um, if you're filling bottles and, you know, on behalf of a state program as opposed to managing that monitoring program, I don't think you can leverage that in the same way I could be wrong. That's the second one. It'll come back to me. I'm not trying to push back. We've certainly, oh, this is it. I don't, you can hit me. <laughs> Please feel free. Here it comes. I actually believe that the La Rosa Partnership Program, because it's invested in the individual watershed groups, I believe it builds more capacity among those groups because it's getting all of your volunteers, and you have many, Lay monitoring programs got one or two for a lake. You guys have many for a stream watershed. And you've got eyeballs on that watershed. And those eyeballs translate the things that could happen. And I have seen it time and time again where a watershed group comes together around the nucleus of doing some monitoring and testing. It goes out and conducts that monitoring and testing. Brings the information back, we process it, we tell you, we give you the results, we talk about what it means. But all the while, the group all of a sudden begins to develop this capacity for implementation too. And then for me, our watershed association is an unbelievable example, or what? So having the lay monitoring model may be a disservice in terms of growing capacity out in the landscape. But so I could be totally wrong with that. Go ahead, take a while. Really, you're going to push back on. Go ahead, Kevin. I was going to say, I agree that it does build capacity. But how can we do it in the most effective manner? That's yeah. what we really love getting at. Just having the right tools to use that we can all use. So it's not, you know, one person has their method and we have our method of, of 
doing the sampling, but also reaching out to the community members and informing them of the protests and then informing them of what those um, results mean. So that's really what I'm getting at. And, and I'm hearing you say that the two need to talk to each other better, right? The Lane Monitoring Program and the Rosa. So we need to talk. <laughs> but um, just, to, just to give a specific illustration of, of where I, I've seen that fall apart, and then for Mega, where we're doing such a great job with the La Rosa, meanwhile, our, our late monitoring our monitors moved yeah. away, yeah. <laughs> and we didn't replace them for 30 years. We just lost track of that. We got all on the way. So, much on the Mesa. <laughs> so, so, that, so we need to par partner those two better. And it sounds like the materials could be part of that. You know, not to, not to suck all the air out of the room um, by talking too much, but there's a, a hybrid model that could be really interesting. You know, all of the, the, the strongest LaRosa programs out there have a coordinator, and that coordinator interacts with volunteers. And a way that the state may be able you have to talk about it and figure out. A way that the state may be able to make it more lay monitoring program like is if the, the individuals who are enrolled in the lay stream monitoring program are the coordinators. And the interaction to the individual volunteers across all those sites still lives with the coordinator and with the program as opposed to living with the state. You can see why on a lake, that's what we do. Because a lake is a lake. It's, here it is. You know, but a river system, you know, you have volunteers that live 30 miles apart that are sampling the same resource. So, let me just clarify that. So, I'm not sure I understood it. So, the La Rosa program is effective, you're saying, because there's a person that's being paid by a large group to coordinate it? Sometimes paid, sometimes no. not, you know. Okay. But, but fundamentally, the, the La Rosa partnership programs that really are cooking are the ones that have someone like you and Mary, and they're interacting with other volunteers. You know, I'm just, I'll, I'll, I'm picking on you, but it's, you know, right. it's pervasive throughout the state. Well, I think that's where the model only works, because you have an invested organization right. that's acting as the trainer, but is also trained by the state. Mm -hmm. um, right, and that's the part that's, that lacks. Yeah. Totally admitted, that lacks. That field training component. It happens at Addison. I know, Bob, you were probably there, right, uh, last weekend or two weekends ago. Yeah. Uh, there was a big training in Addison at the Regional Planning Commission. Ethan was there, so Ethan provided some training. Um, but it's kind of still like that. Yeah, and it still, it still needs that person to really drive the process. And it, it has to be sort of that self-starter, you know, comes to a kind of fair level of knowledge, I think, even just to wrap their head around the process. Yeah, so I think it could. I think in terms of establishing standards and groups, I think it could be better states in the world. Go ahead, let's take a couple more questions. Yes. For gaps? There's gaps in the world. 
So that conversation we had outside of this meeting? Well facilitated. So I have a question about funding. So a lot of this seems to be, I've learned a lot today in how the state uses the data, and I didn't realize how closely connected lay monitoring La Rosa was with what the state was doing. And um, I'm just curious if the new Clean Water Fund is going to have, and it seems like this is sort of foundational to the work that we all do, you know, is it conceivable that there could be some ongoing minor funding so that we all get our programs off the ground a little bit faster every year, have a, have a paid coordinator, or cover the cost of samples that aren't doing more, you know, is that a possibility? Um, so the DEC's phase one plan for implementation of Lake Champlain TNDF articulates support for watershed associations external to ER, ecosystem restoration grants, external to 319 grants, external to RPC funding. Specifically, you know, we identify the need to provide support to groups like watershed associations and the conservation districts uh, in that phase one plan. And so that's been translated in the bill into sort of the clean water fund. Okay. And I believe there's some intent, I believe that, I know there's legislative intent for certain chunks of funding to certain organizations, but it doesn't reach down all the way to particular watershed associations. But it's absolutely part of the state's game plan to try and provide some support, because you guys, it's like life support, you know? Um, Did you have a yeah, real quick on that point is that just be careful with the funding cycles because if you're going into something new and you get us into cycles that don't work with the seasons, um, we've had that problem in the past even with 319 where, you know, it takes two years to actually get from the time you get approved for the funding and now you go back to the farmer and you get the report and they give you one year of funding. So you can't get the damn thing done. And, and so just be careful how you structure this thing so that um, if we get dependent upon having financial support by having some sort of staff doing the sampling that we know we get at least we should have two years of funding if we could at least get someone say five years would be great but I know it wouldn't happen. So if we could get at least two years of funding to make that work it would really help. I think that's really good specific input, and I wonder if there a process that watershed groups should be involved in. Let's say H35 passes. Um, what will be the process for deciding how to spend that money, and can we inject ourselves into that process somehow? Earlier on during our, her remarks, Kim mentioned that mm -hmm. the structure around how the Clean Water Initiative Fund would be managed was still up in the air, and it's still very much up in the air. Um, I know that Watersheds United does not engage advocacy, so it wouldn't be a Watersheds United activity, but it would certainly make that to information. Yeah. What I was going to say is any Watershed Association that's a member of Watersheds United that's hearing me say this now, or can call me later to ask, absolutely worthwhile to get in touch with your legislator and articulate the kinds of services that could be provided by the watershed associations for the kind of money that the watershed association needs because they're talking big money in this bill and so you know these are small pieces of, of additional or small pieces of the pie that you know your legislature should go. But the decision, will those, that detail happen in the legislative process or will that be in the it, administrative process? It, it will not except you never know what goes into legislation. Okay. Right, and so what I, you know, what I've been, many people have kind of gotten in touch and to say, hey, let's can we talk about this clean water initiative and what does it mean and how, how can we engage? And the, the stock answer from Commissioner Mears all the way down to you know anybody that works for me um, is, you know, express your support for the clean water initiative in H35 because that's the best way you know to provide for that money to be available. Once it's available, we can figure out, and we will figure out, how it'll all work. But it's got to be available first, and it's still not a done deal. But yeah, I think I think we have urged groups to, to get engaged. That's I just like I think we need the next step. I'm assuming it's going to all pass. 
<laughs> yeah, well, we, I mean, yeah. I have the one key, key message to add to, to what Neil said is that this, how a little bit of funding to a watershed group can go so far. Right. Yeah. And I'm curious about this Marine Corps partnership. I mean, if they're having part time books available for the field season for a couple thousand dollars to have someone to run a program, it seems like a great opportunity for groups that are really all volunteer. That's a super exciting opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I think you know we just need a, a another grant pot that we can draw from that we're not all competing for the same amount of money. You know, we, we definitely need an education pot. We need an ERQ pot, and we definitely need a water quality pot. Yeah. That's monitoring based. Well, the water quality right now, the ERP part is understood. The RPC component is understood. There's some other main organizations in there. There's language in the bill about the need to make data accessible. So there's actually a section on data display, making data available, just like I showed. We need to collect those data. So you know, literally, I don't mean to, I don't mean to flip it off, but or push you off, but the legislators need to hear this now, right? Especially in the Senate. If, if we come back to that, one thing I want to was it would, it would help in the field if some of these premises of, of places that have been fixed. Because what we're always talking about is we've got this problem with what the issue is and what we need to get done. And very seldom do we get to say, and here's an example of over the last two years, three years, this was done, and this has been the outcome. No one was hurt. Everyone's still alive. <laughs> let's let's move on. Yep. So yep. I haven't seen us being able to do that yet mm -hmm. in five years. I mean, I, I did show a couple of examples, sort of with with data, but you know, I know no, pictures of projects. A project squeezed out with simple numbers. Picture, story, result. Yeah, you know, like you right. said, at the bottom of your page, it was phosphorus needs to be da da da. This is where it was. This is where it was. Then now we were here. Yeah. And this is how we got there. And so we've got something to show. And, and the other thing is, lastly, is um, it's as much our fault as anyone, but we don't have a good GIS demonstration you know, in, our, in, in the presentations we do with our meetings so that we can have a, a map up that shows the, the sites, you know, the 12 sites that we test. Because you can't call them by name, uh, that's not allowed. And so we, if we have. So we could say, you know, these are the sites that people can figure out for themselves by looking at the map where they are. Then we could make a little bit more progress. Well, that's part of what we're that's part of what we're building there is to, you know, show you on the map all the locations that are in the archive, which include all of these. Yeah. And lucky for you, Fritz is actually creating a shape file with all the sites, so we'll So that it would be you could there would be like different layers for each group? Could, could, could we look at a map? We could we create a map of this where we would say these are the ones that we want? Or is it just going to be statewide? Could. I mean, it's statewide, but it, it, it's really easy for us to, that, that to do that. that. Uh, not for us. <laughs> no, 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 I know, but, but, but you know, on your behalf. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think that's what you're trying to show. There's value. Because the other thing we don't do well I'm speaking now as a volunteer, we don't do well, is showing the impact of all of us working for free yeah. along with what little money came to get the process done. And this is the outcome. If you had to do that by hiring levels of motion restoration projects, and we do have where we let us have been taken off the impaired waters list and improved. Yet we're at a meeting down in White River yesterday, uh, largely because of the partnerships, bacteria monitoring. On the white, that we focus on agricultural best management practices to small farms. They're the white, and they talked about a project. Uh, Ryan Patch talked about a project that he was involved with with our ecosystem restoration money that we directed towards the first branch of the white because of the, some of the bacteria problems. So, connecting those dots, you know, between, between the monitoring and the implementation and fixing the problem. Yeah. What you guys suggest is just like a searchable database of about success stories for mitigating water issues. 
Well, I guess like who, who's the audience, I guess. Well, yeah, because if it's the legislators that you're trying to show there's value, because the other thing we don't do well, and I'm speaking now as a volunteer, we don't do well is showing the impact of all of us working for free along with what little money came to get the process done, and this is the outcome. If you had to do that by hiring, no offense, say people to come and do that job, it would cost you a, a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. Whereas because we're there locally, doing it locally, under one semi-paid person, that works getting done. And that does not surface very often in the cost ratio of what this is actually costing Fed, state, whatever, compared to what they get. I can certainly look back to the conversation about why a little bit of money would go a long way. It does, yeah. a long way. Volunteer monitoring is not cost free, it's cost free. Oh, no, no, I didn't say we were free. No, no, I know, but that's, that's, a, that's something that people sometimes kind of don't realize. And, and, I, and the other thing that I wanted to bring back up real quick, in case we all leave, is EPSCOR has been a godsend for us. There, the, a lot of the projects that we've had to do on rip rack and stuff, on small projects, you know, when you do a big one with a contractor, that's all fun. But when you were doing small ones, with, you know, inlets and, and culverts and stuff. If it hadn't been for EPSCOR, we would never have to start. Can you expand on that? I just for my own learning? I think it's BYCC, right? Or, or AmeriCorps. AmeriCorps, oh. sorry. Okay. okay. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> it started here. Working with BYCC, I bet. She can speak to it on the end of the okay. table down here. So not EPSCOR. No, not AmeriCorps. No, 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 I'm sorry. Alphabet soup with crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not 20 till. Should we stop here? Neil, you know, quick question. The, the questions that you had on your PowerPoint we didn't get to, would you like feedback on that? Or? I am happy to you know, PDFize that presentation and send it out, put it out on the Watership Tonight website. And, you know, I'm, we're interested in feedback. We're, our capacity right now to take on new stuff, like I turned the rose in the middle of the is a little bit limited. Um, that could always change. <laughs>